the Bioceuticals Integrative Medicine Awards are fast approaching. The Beamers showcase the outstanding talent we have in the Australasian integrative medicine profession and are held in conjunction with the Bioceuticals Research Symposium. To book your ticket to this gala dinner event, visit bioceuticals.com.au and click on the Education tab. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us on the line today is Dr. Penny Caldicott, who's an integrative medicine GP and the founder and director of Invitation to Health, a multidisciplinary clinic on the central coast of New South Wales. Dr. Caldicott is the current president of the Australasian Integrative Medicine Association, that's AMA, and she believes that the integrative medicine focus on prevention of disease can play a significant role in turning back chronic disease in Australia. Welcome to FX Medicine. Penny, how are you? Thank you, Andrew. Very well, thank you. Now, Penny, you've developed a truly multidisciplinary clinic. Um, Tell me how that all started first, I think. What, What was it that you weren't quite happy with just the orthodox sort of box, the orthodox method? Yeah, so um, I became a general practitioner um, and went out into um, conventional general practice. It was actually a very good, very comprehensive general practice. Um, But I started to uh, get a whole lot of patients who were coming to me with um, uh, conditions that at the time some doctors weren't taking so seriously. And these are things like... um, chronic fatigue, uh, people presented with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. And at the time, um, there was a lot of uh, talk about how these things weren't real diagnoses or that these people were just um, stressed or anxious or had a mental health disorder. And so when I started to look after these people, um, uh, you know, I certainly believed them, but my problem was more that I didn't know, didn't have any training to look after them. Uh, and so that's when I started looking into what was going on. And at the time, there wasn't so much structured education as now. And so I just uh, went to as many conferences as I could and talked to as many people as I could and started to bring in different uh, different ways, different ways of talking and hearing these people and different things that we could do to alleviate some of their symptoms. But then I realised that actually... Um, uh, you need a team approach to help people with um, complex problems and that my I was limited in what I could offer. But if I was working with other people, uh, we could offer more as a team. And that's when um, 15 years ago we set up um, Invitation to Health, which is a multidisciplinary centre. And really within, you know, within weeks, you know, our learning, our learning just changed so dramatically. Um, and uh, working together was just so much richer, not only in terms of our own learning, but in terms of patient outcomes. Um, And then over 15 years, we've just developed that into um, a a model where there's just more and more communication, more and more transparency, and now we work in teams where we see patients um, together, so naturopaths, nurse or healthcare coordinator and doctor, and um, we're working on developing um, that even further uh, so, so it is really kind of a very rich way of working. Um, we feel like our outcomes are quite different, and we're starting to measure those. So you can work you you can work co-located, which is pretty cool. You can work in a team together, but you can also work in different locations and care for patients by um, by really communicating. I think we might have to define self care. Is it preventative or is it early intervention? Yeah, that's interesting. So um, I think that uh, there seems to be a lot more initiatives out there for self-care than there used to be in the past. I mean, there's a lot around obesity in children and and talking about diet and nutrition um, in a very general way um, and exercise and, um, you know, screen time and all kinds of stuff that's starting to happen out there kind of in the mainstream. Uh, but I think kind of lost uh, our intuition for self-care. Mm. You know, we, we're growing up in we're growing up in and working in and being in internal environments so much now that people have kind of lost their uh, their connection with nature. <laughs> so as as people get more unwell, so our 
environment and our world gets more unwell and vice versa. It's like we've um, lost connection with our roots and where we come from because we know that it, getting out of nature makes us feel good, makes us feel more connected and does all kinds of things even biochemically um, to our bodies, particularly when we're walking and exercising. Yeah. Um, so I think we've kind of lost our intuition and then we've been fed all this informa- all this rubbish and advertising about eating um, and, you know, and people have forgotten that you actually have to eat food that looks like it's come food. from nature and, <laughs> and that has nutrients in it, you know, rather than stuff that's been manipulated. There's sugar in about 70% of the things you find in the supermarket. So I think people have kind of lost their way and the next generation really has, been exposed to such a different way of 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 being that they you know it, yes i think we're 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 a bit lost in terms of health now i mean in that lots of people are starting to get sick there's lots of people out there doing their own research and going well i I don't want to just mm. go to the doctor and get a diagnosis and be on medication for the rest of my life i'm not saying all doctors do that but we're trained to make diagnoses and manage illness um, and uh, so they're starting to look for their own solutions. And I think that this drive for looking at uh, what's happening to us um, uh, in terms of disease and syndromes and 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 and, uh, and uh, illness and health is being driven by the population, even more so than by therapists and doctors. Um, so people are starting to wake up and go, wait a second, this doesn't feel right to me. You know, what, what else is out there? Yeah, I've often thought like, if we um, subscribe to the healthy weight, the healthy blood pressure, the healthy whatever the normograph says we are in our early years, aren't we just programming ourselves to then therefore fall into the diagnoses that are usual in older age? <laughs> like, aren't we just accepting of what um, bad is sort of thing? Yeah, so those are... All of those things are just indicators of well-being, right? And of course, we know that we're know we're realizing more and more that each person is totally individual. So there are variations there that we have to take into account for each person that we're with. Um, but they're only indications of what's going on, you know. So if you've got a raised cholesterol, the question is why? Why have you why have you got a raised <laughs> cholesterol, and what's not working well in your environment that you've created or in the environment that you're in hmm. with your genome? To express like that, so um, so really, it's uh, yeah. It, I think that a lot of the the things that we talk about as prevention in general practice really um, uh, got to do with screening. So you're screening for problems, yeah. and then when they arise, either the person is heading towards a diagnosis and it's seen like that. Or, um, or some people will be saying, okay, so why are we up to this and, and what's going on in that person's life as an individual that is causing the, the genome to express like this or causing them to have this type of phenotype? And I think in, in you know, in conventional medicine, there, you know, we, we, we're trained to do that, but we're not trained necessarily in all the things we need to look for particularly diet, dietary and environmental nutritional stuff. Um, but, uh, and, but I think in integrative medicine, um, doctors and other practitioners, uh, you know, are, are trained to look at that quite differently. When you say trained, what's their sort of guidelines? Where do they get those guidelines from? Yeah, so the, the RACGP, which is the College of General Practitioners, and this is for practitioners, obviously many other doctors uh, look at prevention as well, um, but the College of GPs has um, a red book and the red book is really um, all the parameters and recommendations around prevention and encouraging healthy lifestyle for prevention of disease. Um, and this includes all the, the kind of screening that doctors uh, are meant to do at each stage of a person's life. What would be the main areas um, that the Red Book would concentrate on? So they uh, they concentrate on um, each age group. So from uh, the prenatal advice, the uh, pregnancy advice, the uh, infants all the way through to the elderly. But they define a healthy lifestyle or the things that you need to do for a healthy lifestyle to prevent disease um, as uh, in, in seven categories. So one is do not smoke maintain a healthy weight, be active, eat a balanced and nutritional diet, including eating minimal sugar, limiting alcohol consumption, being sun smart and protecting against infection. Um, 
So that's how the actually Cancer Australia and the RACGP uh, define the, the, the kind of more general advice that we would give for disease prevention. Okay, so let's tease apart a few of these aspects. Um, you know, smoking, that's a pretty obvious one. What about alcohol, particularly in Australia? Yeah, de- I mean, definitely the smoking one, but to, but I think that the, the key about anything that has become an addiction is you've got got to work out why um, why that addiction is taking place in that person's life at, at that particular point in time and work on that. And it would be the same with alcohol as well. So, look, I think um, that uh, there, there are general guidelines about alcohol. Um, there's a general, general uh, thought that people should drink probably no more than four nights a week or have at least three nights a week off drinking. There's a different amount of alcohol for men and women um, and technically that should apply to kind of weight as well. Um, so a smaller woman should drink less, um, you know, than a, than a bigger man um, proportionally. But, but I think that it's also very individual so that we know um, that there are people who can only drink one glass of alcohol and already start to have the effects of it. So we're all different in ways that we metabolise alcohol. We ask every doctor uh, would be or should be asking about alcohol intake on a regular basis and we would be talking to our patients um, about that regularly. Um, So so I think that that's really a big part of any any initial consultation and ongoing care of a patient in general practice. How do you cover this with regards to the Australian cultural acceptance of alcohol, particularly, you know, we're we're the highest drinkers per capita. Um, How do you then talk to somebody on a personal level about, hey, this this level of intake may not be good for you? Well, again, it's it's a really individual thing. I, I think that there are the generalised discussions, but if you get the impression that someone's really kind of struggling with it or it is a big kind of cultural thing amongst their their uh, group of friends that they're with, well, then you have to really personalise it. And sometimes it takes a long time. Mm. Um, so I've had people like particular men who live alone and they're only – the real social contact is at the pub every night and that's where they hang out with their mates. And so it's quite a journey to um, to morph um, that behaviour into in terms of drinking uh, into something that may be suiting them better. So I think you've got to use what's going on in their life, what kind of um, find out how it might be affecting them in a, in a negative way um, if it is, and it probably is if they're drinking, you know, if, you know five, six, um, stubbies a night or mm. something or more. Mm. Um, so you've got to find a way in for each individual. And so I guess that's why in general practice and probably for naturopaths, nutritionists, other people who look after patients on an ongoing basis that you have time. And so while, you know, you might have these discussions, you know, even over a period of a couple of years before you get behavioural change. Um, but I think it's really about listening to and finding out how that kind of behaviour is um, is integral to their, you know, their social aspect yep. or their loneliness or, or whatever else is going on for them, so that you can work out, you know, other ways for them to, to, to feel connected or to be able to change behaviours within a, within the same. Uh, social context. You mentioned loneliness there, which of course has been in the news of late. This is a um, mid twenty eighteen. That you know we've never felt more isolated, more lonely in our in our existence as humans. I, I think there was something from London um, a few weeks ago that I listened to, and of course that branches out into mental health. How do we as health practitioners? How can we be more aware of our patients' mental health? And indeed, what can we teach them to be more aware of their own mental health to go, hang on, this ain't right? Mm. So that's interesting because, um, again, I, I think that the most important thing when you're with a patient is to really listen to their journey. So very often people present with very physical symptoms um, and and those physical symptoms are actually telling us that they're having a problem uh, uh, with anxiety, for example, or depression or loneliness. Um, but you have to spend the time to listen beyond the symptoms and to, to find out what's actually going on in their lives. Um, and I think that, uh, that people are lonely um, even within 
families, actually. Um, and I think that we have a culture that's, that's changed um, so much in probably in the last 40 or 50 years, maybe even more so in the last 10 years or so, um, that we've, we've actually forgotten about, um, about uh, social connection as being really important to us. So, for example, I have this great example. I was watching a show years ago about um, a group of people who were interviewed before the Berlin Wall came down um, in East in East Berlin. And before it came down, they said that, well, they didn't really have that much to do. And so what they would do, you know, when they had time and they weren't, you know, at work would be to hang out together and they'd just be at someone's house. They'd spend heaps of time talking, playing games, drinking cups of tea, what, whatever they were doing, and that after the wall came down and they got more integrated into the, the culture of West Berlin, mm. that they just didn't find they had time anymore to do that. Wow. So so I think it's like, you know, and that, that they'd really missed that. The fact that there is so much to do um, means that we're so busy and the fact that we now have all this information at our fingertips means we can spend, and we all do this, you know, spend too much time looking at things online and thinking that that actually connects us to the world. Yeah. Um, but in a way, it kind of, I mean, it can in some ways, but in a way it does the opposite. Um, and so I think that we've, you know, th those kind of long afternoons and days of just hanging together yep. um, are something that we maybe do less and less. So I think uh, that people find themselves alone. So they're, they're working hard. They may have, you know, one full-time job or they may even have a couple of jobs. They've got kids. They've got the, – the life is just so busy that that social um, connection is just not is, – is just not there. Um, and um, not only that, the connection with all the things that are happening in the world, all the things that are so distressing, I think put us in a, a permanent state of distress or stress. So like we were talking about it this morning at breakfast with our um, young adult children children and um you know you see 70 people have died somewhere from an earthquake or from a mudslide or something and it's just like common mm. right mm. or there's horrible things happening in syria and you know kids dying and yeah. families being distressed and it, and it just becomes commonplace but but it also creates a, a level of distress for a collective distress for all of us and so i think we have to be really um on the lookout for that distress manifesting in people's lives and it might manifest as symptoms like we can talk about in a sec um, or just kind of really obvious mood things um, and I think we need to be really alert for that all the time and and working with people to find ways for them to reconnect so reconnect to nature reconnect to family if that's appropriate reconnect to to other people in their lives um, uh, become involved in communities um, where they feel like they're making contributions, um, that kind of thing. So, so I mean, I th you know, people can present with, uh, I know we were going to talk about kind of red flag things, but chest pain, for example. Now, of course, that's an issue that you have to take medically very seriously. Um, but some people just uh, are so stressed that, that they're um, having kind of low-grade panic mm. Um, and they might present with palpitations. Um, you know, I feel like my heart's fluttering at the same time my chest feels a bit tight and I'm finding it hard to get a full breath in, um, that kind of thing. Um, or it may be presenting as digestive symptoms. So, oh, you know, I just, you know, have all these IBS-like symptoms. You know, I'm getting I'm getting diarrhoea or um, I'm getting tummy pain. Um, I'm finding it difficult to digest my food. I mean, there's many ways, and of course, all of those things you've got to investigate in other ways. But there's many ways that people can present with um, with stress-related kind of symptoms. And we know that anyway, stress changes you biochemically. Mm. You know, noradrenaline and cortisol and adrenaline all, um, you know, all make you use lots of micronutrients, for example. Um, and so in times of stress, you might present with cold sores or or viral illnesses or chest infections or whatever because of uh, because of that level of stress and what it's doing physiologically and biochemically to your body. I think one of the best programs I've seen was the Are You OK Day. Um, mm -hmm. However, delving into that, I'll, I'll, I'll always remember... Um, Hugh Jackman talking that it's not just going, are you okay? Yeah, sure, mate. Oh, okay. No worries. We'll get on with the day then. It's not as easy as that. It's no, seriously, I know you and I've noticed something about you. What's wrong? 
and there's this real, it's a care. So it's a connection. You can't just walk up to somebody and expect them to tell you about your de- their depression. Conversely, the person who is suffering that mood doesn't want to be seen as being a drag on their friends, on their peer groups, indeed on their workplace, if that be the case. And so there's this real resistance to accept, to admit that, yeah, I'm not in a good place. How do you overcome that as a healthcare practitioner? Yeah, so that that's interesting because that's the kind of conversation I'm having with people a lot of the time. Um, so, I mean, firstly, they may have felt this way for so long that they think it's normal. They see other people feeling a bit like this, so they think it's normal. And so sometimes it's kind of teasing out what's going on for them and, and, and helping them to see that that's not actually normal um, and that they've had other times in their life where they've felt much better than that. So, I mean, even just putting a context around um, how they're feeling um, there is there is a very strong, particularly amongst the kind of Anglo-Saxon culture in Australia, and I know we're much more diversified than that, but amongst that group of people, a, a, whole, a whole thing around, well, if there's something wrong, then I should be able to fix it. Yeah. I shouldn't have to rely on anyone else to do it. It's my thing. And those people, you know, it takes quite a while and a, a real kind of um, – uh, um, time to make connection with them so that they can trust you and stuff um, to help them see that um, actually we're not all here together to do it alone. <laughs> yeah. That um, that that actually asking for help and and going and getting help is something that many people can do, and that it's okay to do that because we're so trained. You know, a certain group of us are so trained to think that that we shouldn't. We should be able to fix this up ourselves. Mm. So that's part of it. I talk to people about that whole collective distress that, you know, it may not even be, you know, certain things in their life, but there's a kind of collective distress at how distressed the world is and how distressed so many people are um, around the world um, uh, and, and that, that that's okay and normal to feel that pain as well. But to acknowledge that it's not just your pain that all of us are feeling it is sometimes really helpful for people. Um, the the part of what you brought up before is also really important, and that is, you know, everyone's busy and everyone's stressed, and so I don't want to stress anyone out with my problem. Um, and so I had a conversation with a patient about that yesterday, and she's been through a very difficult time and really isolated herself from from everyone around her. Um, and I'm trying to help her how she might maybe reengage just gently with a few people. Um, and and the the comment which is common is you know well you know everyone's got their own thing, so I often say to people okay so if you had a friend who'd been distressed and disconnected and kind of gone off on her own and came back to you and said look you know um, this is what's happened to me but I'd really like to catch up with you for a coffee or go for a walk together I mean would you say no. Mm. And no, no, I mean, almost nobody would, right? So when you say that to people, they go, oh, no, of course I wouldn't have a problem. And so I say, well, then you could probably imagine that most people, you know, unless you've had a terrible falling out with them, um, would be happy for you to approach them like that and, and would make the time because it's something you would you would also do. And so it's hard, So it, there's lots of different ways of helping people to see that they're not as alone as they feel, that other people are feeling similar things, that this connection is really vital um, for our well-being, um, and that that asking for help is is um, it is not a terrible thing or an unreasonable thing to do. But I guess with each person, you just need to spend the time to see where their own limitation or blockage is yeah. in terms of of, of reconnecting. Um, and it might just be severe anxiety. What would I say? How would I say it? Um, uh, maybe they don't feel good enough about themselves to be able to, you know, to feel worthy of making that connection. There's all kinds of um, different reasons why people um, um, get isolated and and how that isolation just fuels all that kind of inner distress. And that's not just from the sufferer's point of view. The, the person who might want to be helping them might also have their own issues and might feel unworthy. And and so I, I totally take your point that just saying, hey, you know, you want to grab a coffee, cup of coffee or you want to go to lunch, something innocuous that's social that you would invariably talk at is a great way to break the ice and, and hopefully uncover some sort of issue that might need further help. I 
picked up on what you were saying earlier about anxiety and you're talking about, I can't get a full breath, I've got palpitations and that sort of feeling um, of a weight on your chest. And then you were talking about um, uh, digestive upset. And, and I, I guess I'm concentrating more on upper GI upset here, the heartburn, but that smacks very closely to me, very hard to tease off between um, anxiety or heart attack. How do you do that? Okay. So, um, again, you've got um, the context around how it presents. For, interestingly, you know, when people in general practice come in and you have this whole consultation just before you're about to turn the door handle to go out, they say, oh, yes, and I've had a bit of chest pain. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, so in the context of what you've already talked about, you might have already got that there's a whole lot of stuff going on in their life or they're really stressed. But um, as a doctor, I always go back to what what are the kind of, classic presentations of um, chest pain that might be ischemic or um, show that they've, you know, may either be having or um, may have a heart attack. So um, I usually go back to those classic questions, which we can talk about now, um, but with the realisation also that um, uh, ischemic heart pain or heart attacks can present very atypically. Mm. So it's a really tricky kind mm. of area. And if there's ever any concern as a non-doctor practitioner, you should always, always get that patient to see someone else urgently. Um, and even if that would involve you making a phone call and facilitating that or making sure they get to a hospital or calling an ambulance, then there's, you know, y- your only risk is not doing it. Um, That's but, right. but it's worth kind of teasing it out a little bit, um, it, you know, if you have the skills to do that. And if you don't, someone else would need to do that for you. Um, and so typical kind of um, ischemic chest pain. So ischemic just means, you know, you're not getting enough oxygen to a part of your heart, but you're not necessarily yet having a heart attack um, or you may be on the way to having a heart attack. So um, that would be um, things like um, shortness of breath on exertion. So sometimes people present and they go, oh, you know, I'm really fit and I'm used, used to, you know, usually I can, I'm doing really well, but nothing's changed in what I'm doing except that now I get short of breath when I walk up a hill or upstairs or something else. And so then to tease that out a bit further, you might say, okay, so um, when you're getting short of breath, do you have any um, tightness or heaviness in your chest um, and and you can go through that heaviness is like um, uh, you know that some you've got a real pressure on your chest or something's like sitting on your chest so mm. if they had that you'd be quite you'd be quite concerned mm. um, and with that tightness or heaviness um, uh, do you get um, any sweating um, because when people are having ischemic chest pain usually they they often get, they, they would get sweating as well um, and then sometimes there's a referred pain that goes either up into the neck or down into the the top of the uh, left arm so that would be the classic kind of symptoms um, of ischemic chest pain um, and sometimes people will also get that at rest they suddenly get uh, chest tightness or heaviness, they get shortness of breath and those other symptoms that I've just talked about. So it doesn't always have to happen um, with exercise and the person doesn't have to look unwell. Uh, I mean, they might in that moment, but they don't. They, they could be a really fit person as well. It's not always the kind of classic person that you would think would have a heart attack. Um, so um, those are the things that I would check and then I would do a physical examination. But if anyone presents with those kind of disturbing symptoms um, and they have them at the time, then urgent help is required like an ambulance or something. But if they've had them in, they've been having symptoms like that but don't currently have them, they need to get to a doctor very quickly to work out whether this sounds really like an ischemic thing or not. If they're not having any of those symptoms, uh, but their symptoms are nevertheless kind of quite intense and getting more frequent and worrying, they still need to be assessed. Um, but people can present with all kinds of other symptoms like um, that that kind of not seeming to get enough breath. And that's a really interesting one to tease out because I find a lot of people present like that. Um, so if they're presenting like that and they've got kind of major stressors in their life, um, I ask them about what that feels like. And often you'll find that um, they are able to actually get a deep breath in, but they actually feel like they're not getting a deep breath in. Um, and then, I, then I, I'm talking to, and I'm sure many practitioners of all types are doing this and talking to people about their breathing. So when we're in a state of stress, often we get that kind of that tight feeling um, in our epigastrium or um, where our diaphragm is because when we're stressed, often we get, you know, the diaphragm kind of contracts and we do that upper 
upper airway breathing or upper lung breathing. Yep. So we're not really taking a deep breath in. Um, and after a while, that can often feel like you're not getting enough enough breath. Um, and so um, sometimes I, I, if I if I feel pretty clear that that it doesn't look like that um, there's a there's a heart problem, I will talk them through some um, breathing exercises to relax their diaphragm. There's many different ways of doing breathing exercises and and see if, for example, they have that in the moment to see whether that goes away when we do those exercises together. Um, uh, and so it, that's kind of quite a common uh, presentation of stress that, you know, I just don't feel like I'm getting enough air in. And, and I often refer to that as something like breath hunger. Uh, so they are getting the air in and they can take a deep breath, but it just feels like they can't. Um, and then people often present with, and I don't know whether, I, I, I guess I'd have to ask naturopaths and Chinese medicine practitioners and others about whether they present to them with palpitations. Um, they often present to us with what they would say is palpitations. And then it's really a matter of finding out what does it feel like, when is it happening, um, uh, how often is it happening, is it getting more frequent, those kind of things. And I, I yeah. suppose um, uh, you know, to really delve into uh, what kind of symptoms they have. That's probably something that, need, I, I, I mean, that is something that needs to be done by by a doctor. Um, but many people present with kind of like a little missed heartbeat or something like that that's worse when they're stressed, worse when they're drinking coffee, um, sometimes worse if they're having more alcohol, um, those kind of things. But it's often another manifestation of someone who's feeling overwhelmed. What's the best way in this instance and others for practitioners to communicate to a GP? Okay, so the the first thing is to is to get the permission to do that because clearly um, you'll need the patient's permission. Um, some uh, uh, patients will have, you know, quite a good relationship with a long-term um, GP that they know that they can get into. Um, uh, but I think it's really important for some communication to happen as well in terms of some formal communication. Um, so in the circumstance where someone tells you they have a history of something and you've kind of teased it out but it's not something that's happening right now, then um, a letter would be a good way to communicate. Um, so um, I'm uh, president of the um, Australasian Integrative Medicine Association and we've had a interprofessional working group that's recently put together some referral letters and we're going to be setting up some training to how to write these referral letters. So some of these referral letters are just like, I'm, I'm seeing this patient and this is uh, what I've been doing and this is the rationale for it and this is what's happening. But amongst these referral letters that we're going to be uh, uh, using in AMO and training people to use is a red flag referral letter. Yep. And the point of the red flag referral letter is to say in a language that the doctor would be happy with is, you know, I've seen this patient, they've presented with these kind of symptoms and I'm a bit concerned mm. that there might be something like mm. X happening. Yeah. Um, and I've, uh, I've uh, emphasised to the patient that it's very important that they come and see you as soon as possible. Um, and, uh, and so that, that kind of letter... Um, uh, you, you would then have to negotiate, you could write, but then you would just have to negotiate with the patient whether you take that letter along to the doctor, whether you would um, pop it in the post if you felt like, you know, it wasn't urgent, urgent, or whether it might be a letter that you might um, fax to the doctor or, or um, communicate in some other way, uh, either through the doctor's receptionist or directly to the doctor, depending on what the circumstance was. Yeah. Um, but but yes, very important that the patient is on on board with with the communication that you're going to have with the doctor, and that they understand what you're communicating. Unless, of course, it's a an acute coronary syndrome in which it's an ambulance call and get the hell to hospital now. <laughs> Ex well, exactly. If someone was having that right in front of you, and I mean, it's true that you know early on in our career, sometimes a panic attack can look like that. Um, I, I remember being a very young GP and sending someone to hospital, and the ambos coming and looking at me going, yeah, she's a newie. <laughs> um, uh, but who cares? But, you know, we, but who cares, right? So the, the person is safe and um, and you've taken care of making sure that they're safe. And that is the most important thing, um, that you make sure that the patient is going to be safe and then you, that you're not missing something. So what about self-care for more insidious type conditions? Um, cancer, for instance. What about um, sexually transmitted infections? Uh, I think in terms, um, in general practice, we're probably... Uh, kind of hyper-vigilant about cancer because there's 
so much of it around and you know the the stats now are like one in three people in a lifetime will have some kind of cancer um, and so we do lots of screening and lots of education about screening but you know as another practitioner there you you'll have some patients who are not that happy about seeing doctors and may not be seeing them regularly so it is really good to um, encourage the patients to have screening, um, regular screening with doctors or other services like mammograms and stuff like that. But but also you may have to kind of um, guide them a bit if they're really reluctant to see someone or they refuse to see someone. So in general practice, we would do um, yearly skin checks and we'd be encouraging and educating patients on what to look for um, uh, if they get lesions that um, that are different from other um, spots on their bodies that are changing, that are growing, that are irregular, that might get crusting, bleeding, pain, that kind of stuff. That if they get anything like that, that they need um, to come and to go to a skin clinic or come and see their doctor or or, or get some help in working out whether this this new lesion is dangerous or not. Um, so we we talk to them prevention wise. Um, you know, there's the slip, slop, slap campaign um, that um, that people would say is very successful. I often talk to people about um, getting that little bit of sun um, every day in summer and winter, so 10 minutes in summer and 15 minutes in winter, depending on your skin mm. type, obviously longer if you've got darker skin. Um, but then other than that, kind of maybe, um, you know, using uh, covering your body rather than using lots of sunscreen, um, using sunscreen when you can't do that. Um, so that's something that I guess we probably do on a really super regular basis with our patients. And if you've got someone who's not seeing um, doctors, then that would be the the kind of advice that you'd, you'd you'd be wanting to give them, apart from encouraging them to get a regular skin check. It's something that we I think we really need to be aware of that patients may not have the knowledge that we do about what the significance of lumps, bumps and bleeding is. Yes, absolutely. And and interestingly, when we started doing our combined clinic with naturopath and doctor, we had a number of patients who came to that clinic who would normally not see doctors. Hmm. And in the first six months, we diagnosed three pretty serious progressed cancers because these people, despite symptoms and knowing that they were a problem, would not come and see doctors. Um, and so, yeah, it is really important for people to be aware that 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 um, the patient may A, not be aware or B, um, avoiding yeah. looking at the the, the, the the obvious problem. And so asking some of the questions, um, you know, they've got bowel issues, but some of the other questions like, you know, the, the changes to your bowels recent, because um, that could mean that there, there could be something going on like a tumour or something, um, are, you know, is there blood in your stool, um, uh, you know, do they have signs of anemia, other kinds of things to kind of work out. I mean, I guess as doctors, we all, always kind of go, well, what's the worst case scenario and let's rule that one yeah, out. Yeah. Um, but then that's a kind of a different way of thinking um, maybe than other practitioners, but we, we probably all need to do that to, to some degree um, to to cover the patient and also to cover ourselves while we're, we're, we're looking after them to make sure that, that we're, you know, we're, we're not looking after something really serious as, as um, some, and calling it irritable bowel syndrome, for example. Yeah. And of course, that second part of the question, which was a bit disparate, <laughs> so sexual health. What should we yes. be A, aware of ourselves and B, teaching our patients? It's interesting because, um, you know, uh, we all remember those of us that are a bit older when um, HIV first came on the scene mm. um, and how um, hypervigilant everyone had to become about sexual health. And um, it doesn't, it's not that HIV doesn't exist anymore, but it is kind of, um, for the most part, kind of quite well managed when people do get it, um, however awful it is to have that diagnosis. Um, but that hypervigilance about protection um, in terms of sexual health um, ha has changed and people aren't as careful um, as they used to be. And interestingly, um, one of the groups that we find that who, who are not very careful are the people who've been married um, and get divorced and they're in their 40s and they're having a new relationship and it's right. almost like they've forgotten that that it's really important to protect. So, I mean, sexual health, um, in terms of prevention, starts in school. Um, uh, hopefully, um, uh, GPs are kind of encouraging those messages, um, and uh, and and peers. And there's plenty of um, stuff that goes out on social media and public education campaigns. But despite that, um, 
the the um, infectious the STIs are kind of becoming more uh, not only more frequent, but we're also getting resistant um, cases of gonorrhea and, mm. um, and and other things like syphilis and stuff like that. So it's still very important um, that we that we frequently just recheck that with our patients, particularly patients who are. Um, not in a long-term um, cohesive relationship because even a long-term relationship doesn't guarantee anything um, and that's also something to remember. I was having a conversation with Moira Bradfield regarding sexual health and um, I just thought about if somebody isn't comfortable with visiting their normal GP because of their social relationship with them, if you like, because maybe the rest of the family might be there um, visiting that same GP and the person might have had an affair, whatever the reason, practitioners can teach their patients that it's quite fine and safe and accepted, at least in Australia. I know this may well be different in other countries, but in Australia, you, you have the sexual health clinics. And so patients can go and see these clinics as well. Yes, that's right, Andrew. So sexual health clinics are a good way to go um, for people who don't want to disclose behaviours um, and symptoms to their GPs. Um, and, um, you, you know, any practitioner can, uh, can talk about sexual health clinics and encourage people to go there um, if they're concerned that the patient may um, have a um, sexually transmitted infection um, or, or some concerns about that. Um, and I think it's also reasonable to, um, to ask uh, patients about their, um, uh, their sexual preferences and sexual, health pra- and sexual practices. Um, it's not easy thing to ask about, but um, I, I think that it's also reasonable because it's a way of kind of assessing risk. Mm. Um, sometimes you ask, you know, sometimes people will give you a little bit of information. Um, they go to parties and uh, they mention something about sexual practices at parties. It's worth, you know, if they give you that opening, it's worth going into that. You know, is that so when you're at a party, you know, would it be with a man or a woman or, you know, could it be with both or, or something like that to kind of elicit whether there, there's risk associated with, with the types of behaviours that they have. Um, and it's worth knowing that there are all kinds of behaviours that, that, that are happening out there that people segregate into a part of their life that, um, that they don't share with anyone else. Um, they might not consider themselves homosexual, for example, but they may have uh, uh, um, MSM or um, men having sex with men may be doing that and see that as another part of their life that doesn't relate to <laughs> to their you know their their other partnership. Yeah. So there, you know, there are all kinds of issues that are worth if people give you an opening to go in and ask just a couple of questions to see um, if there are some risky behaviours, um, and you can always ask about um, you know symptoms. And just moving a little bit further on from there, obviously a medical practitioner is going to have different responsibilities and different things that they're allowed to do with regards to examination. But what about things like vaginal and penile health? Yeah, so it's interesting. I remember having a case of, well, a few cases actually of women who had been to uh, another practitioner and they'd said, oh, you know, I've got this terrible thrush and it keeps coming back and it's really, you know, it's really painful. We've done all this stuff and it doesn't work and I've got the symptoms now and I have a look and they've actually got herpes. So so it is tricky. Um, and, um, I, I mean, what would have alerted me in that circumstance was the fact that they were saying it was really painful mm. because thrushes generally can be uncomfortable but it's not necessarily and really irritating but not necessarily painful. Um, but yes, so so it is if people are having recurrent symptoms and it's a part of the body that as a naturopath or a nutritionist or another practitioner that you wouldn't normally examine, it's important to get them to someone who can examine them and do and do some swabs because it may be something totally different than you think. And although thrush is common, um, there, there are many other things that could be going on um, at the same time or instead of. Um, something like thrush. Um, so, so the examination stuff is really important, particularly if there are recurrent symptoms um, or severe symptoms. And changes in exudates and things like that? For anything yeah, so, from NSU to bacterial vaginosis? Yes, exactly, exactly. And so, I mean, you, you can learn a little bit about different discharges, what they are. So in women, you know, a, a white cheesy discharge is, you know, almost always going to be something like thrush if, if the symptoms, you know, correlate with that, um, whereas a discharge that might be yellow or green is going to be something different than that. Um, and the same for men, you know, penile discharge is clearly not normal. It needs to be, it needs to be sorted out um, 
uh, men can also carry uh, sexually transmitted infections with no symptoms at all, um, as can women to some degree as well. Um, and and any any young person um, uh, should be regularly screened um, by their GP for chlamydia um, because chlamydia is an STI that, that's quite prevalent and c- can cause big problems um, for women on. in terms of fertility. Okay, so what about things like, uh, we, we mentioned insidious, often undiagnosed things, things like type 1 diabetes. They don't often present until something weird happens, um, you know, whether it be behaviour or something like that. So, um, yeah, type 1 diabetes is a really tricky one because it, it happens kind of relatively quickly, like um, often over weeks and stuff. And they can present in really funny ways. Like I remember someone presenting just with, you know, the presentation was constipation. Actually, the the practitioner at the time was treating them for constipation, and it was a it was a young girl. But um, at the time uh, when she presented with those symptoms, um, there there wasn't the insight to ask for other symptoms um, that may be coming along with that. So she had fatigue, and okay, so heaps of people have got fatigue, um, but the fatigue and the constipation were new. Mm. Um, and really out of character for this this young girl. Um, and she also had signs of dehydration, um, weight loss, and um, the other symptoms that you would always ask for a, a polyuria and polydipsia. So polyuria means that you're passing lot. You, you might go frequently, but you're actually passing lots of urine. Um, and polydipsia is um, uh, thirst. So these people become can become very thirsty and be passing lots of urine even at night. Um, so you're not getting up to do a little wee, you're getting up and passing a whole lot of urine and that's because of the high level of um, glucose in the blood. Um, and so type 1 diabetes is, is a tricky one. It presents, but, but what you're really looking for are symptoms that have presented suddenly that are totally um, out of the norm for that person. Um, and if you get a constellation of symptoms and signs that are like that, so fatigue, dehydration, weight loss, abdominal pain, polyurine, polydipsia, you'd be definitely looking straight away um, mm. to exclude um, type 1 diabetes, which of course is different than, than the type 2 diabetes that comes from the metabolic syndrome that develops over a longer period of time um, uh, and can present with some of those symptoms, but definitely not the weight loss, unlikely to have that kind of abdominal pain and the symptoms you know, are gradually presenting over time. Right at the beginning, we were talking about fatigue and chronic fatigue, but what we skipped over then was something like sleep apnea. How do you twig to be aware of it? Um, and indeed, what should you teach other practitioners and indeed patients to be aware of it? Sure. So um, sleep apnea um, seems to be diagnosed more and more now. Um, uh, there are, of course, many reasons for people developing sleep apnea. Um, you start to be thinking about sleep apnea and asking more questions when people present with specific kind of symptoms. So um, fatigue, again, we've talked about fatigue is such a common um, common symptom. Um, but when someone's really tired, I mean, of course, we're going to ask about sleep, aren't we? Because um, if you're fatigued and sleeping well, it's a very different issue than if you're fatigued and not sleeping well. The problem is that some people with sleep apnea, you know, aren't aware of not sleeping well. They just wake up unrefreshed and are, are tired a lot of the day. So then the next question is, um, you know, ha- have you been witnessed to be snoring? Um, and people who live alone sometimes don't know that, but they might say, oh, I went away on a weekend with a friend and I was told that I was, you know, really snoring a bit. And so the next question you would ask if someone has been snoring and is tired and wakes up unrefreshed is whether anyone around them has witnessed them kind of waking up uh, uh choking a bit yeah. um, or, or have had spells where they've actually stopped Stop breathing. breathing yeah. um, and many people, you know, have had that witness. So people um, who sleep with them have witnessed it. But even yesterday I was talking to a woman and she said that her husband sleeps so heavily that he's never noticed, but she went away with some friends and they noticed it when, when they were sharing a room with her. Yeah. Um, one of the other um, presentations in these people is um, microsleeps. And I had someone yesterday as well who presented and said, look, I've had a couple of microsleeps where I've just found myself in the bushes. Uh, I've been driving, you know, a couple of hours and I just veer off the road and found myself in the bushes. Or even that pre-microsleep where it's, I'm so tired, I don't even know whether I'm going to get up to the next place on the highway where I can pull over. 
So, I mean, the important thing with these people is to say you cannot do long drives until we sort this out. Like, you have to only do short drives yeah. and where where there's a place you can pull over. But sometimes the microsleeps happen so quickly yes. that people don't even realise they're coming. Or even they can be in the middle of talking to someone when they're tired in the evening and just fall asleep mid-sentence. That that kind of – that would really alert you to, to, um, uh, to possible sleep apnea. Um, morning headaches. So some people present with morning headaches, um, and that can be a sign of, of, of poor sleep and the, the and sleep apnea. Um, uh, it, insomnia. So some of these people they don't realise that they're actually having apneic spells, but they find they're waking up a lot, um, and they haven't presented with that typical kind of waking up, kind of choking and gasping for breath. Um, waking up with a dry mouth and a, and a sore throat every morning can be another symptom and the frequent need to urinate at night. Um, and that might just be because they're waking up and then they're going, oh, I need to pass urine or it might be all part of the picture for them. So they're the, they're the kind of symptoms that you would you would be asking for to try and put together a picture of whether this looks like sleep apnea and then, of course, um, uh, refer them to uh, the GP or if you're a GP, refer them to a sleep clinic of which there are millions now all over the place. Yeah. i got to say, you said a very important word there, picture. I think it's interesting that... In their isolation, just waking up and voiding urine could be diabetes, could be BPH, could be um, sleep apnea. So it, could, it could be a presentation of so many issues, could be diabetes. It's, of course, our training which forms that picture of what you think the most likely suspect or suspects would be. And then you treat or test to confirm that and then move on with a treatment plan. And I thank you so much for taking us through. Obviously, there's so many that we could cover We've covered a few of the more important ones. I'd just really like to thank you for joining us on FX Medicine and taking us through the responsible way to take care of somebody and indeed to refer on when the need uh, arises. Thanks, Penny. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for covering these really important topics. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. FX Medicine has exciting developments for 2019, the first of which is a brand new podcast series hosted by Dr. Mark Donoghue. Stay tuned for more updates.